Welcome to Living Outside the Box. Our guest for today is John Jacob Schmidt. He's the host of Radio Free Redoubt, a conservative libertarian-leaning podcast that supports Christian principles. John is also the head of Amron, a communications network for like-minded patriots in America. And now, here's your host, Lance Bowman. Welcome back to Living Outside the Box. We have with us today John Jacob Schmidt. John, how you doing today? Hey, I'm good. I'm doing good. Happy New Year to you guys. Yes, Happy New Year to you. Happy belated Christmas. And uh, it's going to be an exciting, interesting new year we're going into for sure, huh? Yes, it is. It's going to be challenging. So let's jump right in. I mean, ever since the election, everybody's talking about, uh, you know, all their high hopes for Trump and everybody's got their eyes glued to cabinets and agency picks. And I don't know. I mean, a lot of people are getting buyer's remorse. Some of the guys look good, you know, EPA, uh, education, maybe energy, but a lot of stuff doesn't look so good. Um, You know, some of these picks, a lot of Goldman Sachs guys and uh, Pompeo, the CIA guy, he's kind of, you know, pro surveillance state. And uh, what's your take on all of this? Should we be worried? Were you uh, excited about Trump from the get go? Or should we be getting buyer's remorse? What's uh, what's the sit rep on that? Well, I've always thought uh, for, for the longest time that uh, for Trump, this is the ultimate reality show for him. This is the pinnacle. And, uh, you know, he's a very uh, egocentric, narcissistic person which pretty much uh, anybody who thinks that they should be president of the United States is going to be in that category. But on the elections, I I have to admit, I was very excited when he, well, let's say I I wasn't excited about when somebody said, hey, can you believe it? Trump won. I said, who cares? Hillary lost. Yes. I really believe that we uh, dodged a big bullet there uh, for liberty, for uh, just uh, the last vestiges of Americanism, um, basically our national identity was just uh, kept together probably only for a short time or at least for a time. It's uh, what's coming to America, one man can't stop. Um, This is decades of uh, economic crisis, constitutional crisis. And Trump is, uh, I hate to say it, but He's constitutionally illiterate. So as far as uh, defending liberty and defending the Constitution, I believe he wants to defend the rule of law. But I'm not sure what if he understands really what that truly means or, or if the, he understands the, the highest law, the Constitution, really thoroughly. And uh, one of the encouraging things about him becoming a pres- the president is that He can't be bought. He is from outside of the system, from the establishment, and they can't control him, which is why the Republicans and the Democrats hated him and wanted to destroy him from the beginning. So it's encouraged to see somebody that's from outside the establishment get in there. I do believe he loves this country. And uh, you, you don't have to, it doesn't really take that special of a person to recognize that we have to seal our borders and protect our borders, that we have to stop spending more than we make. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some, just some simple truths there that it really doesn't take a a, a special presidential candidate to realize. And fortunately uh, the one that does realize that, or one of uh, many people that realize that became president. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm very optimistic that Hillary is not the president, but, uh, I'm I'm concerned about some things with with Trump and the biggest challenge that we face is a looming economic crisis that one economic expert after another says this this is not sustainable. I mean there's it's mathematically impossible for us to stop a financial collapse, an economic collapse of the, not just the United States, but the domino effect, you know, on a global scale, which maybe that's what the globalists want. But I don't know. That's, that's my take. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you've, you've pretty much summed it up, pretty much hit the nail on the head. I mean, along those lines, even if uh, Trump's cabinet picks were 
awesome. It still sounds like, you know, the, the economic, just the, the sheer numbers, the way everything adds up. It sounds like stuff might be delayed for a little while, but the inevitable outcome is still going to be bad and, and inevitable. You know, eventually things are going to uh, turn worse. Uh, you know, I heard somebody say this. I can't remember who. I'd love to give him credit. Uh, it was such an accurate appraisal of the situation. Trump winning is like a choking man getting a couple of quick gasps of air in between choking to death. You know, it's uh, it gave us uh, not a lot more time, but a little bit more time. So, you know, we got to make good uh, good use of it, right? Well, we, yeah, absolutely. And that's what I've been saying on Radio Free Redoubt, and that is, for people not to let their foot off the gas. Uh, if you were preparing to be self-reliant, uh, whether it's you know food and fuel storage and uh, you know personal protection, uh, or whether you were involved politically uh, to try to be effective in your community and your state, don't stop because this is a temporary reprieve. And the worst thing that we could do now is to go to sleep and think, oh, hey, Trump's in there. The, the border is going to be sealed and protected. Uh, they're going to stop uh, fast tracking Muslims in to our country. Uh, he's going to fix the economy. Everything's going to be great. But there is the the one thing that's most remarkable about Trump is that because he's not establishment, the entire establishment, the global world order, hates him to death. I I have no doubt. There's secret thoughts and discussions taking place where they would love to figure out a way to kill him because he stands to completely disrupt everything they've been working for for, for decades. And uh, they, even if they didn't go to that extreme and kill him, uh, they are going to obstruct, they are going to subvert everything that he attempts to do. So it's going to be an uphill battle, even if he turns out to be the guy to do all the right things. Uh, he's got an entire world system that is poised to, to go up, again, except for Russia. And then who knows what they're really holding behind their back. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally it. I mean, just in the United States alone, you got what, uh, you know, 20 million some uh, federal employees, including all the military and everybody, all these people getting a a federal paycheck, they have a vested interest in keeping what they've got going, going. So how does one man, you know, really change so many agencies in such a, uh, a bureaucratic, technocratic system? Uh, yeah, even if he is the guy, the benevolent uh, individual, which, you know, he probably isn't, but who knows uh, what the case might be. It would still be tough for him for sure. Um, so, I mean, the question is, okay, you know, what was unique about his win, right, wasn't even just the fact that he won. What was unique is that all of these people across the country were so outraged at the system, outraged at the, the phony baloney two-party system, outraged at what they perceived as a, a globalist control of you know their sovereign America, that they elected him. I mean, the people that elected him were the real significance of this whole election, right? So what happens when those people start to wake up from the honeymoon and realize, okay, Trump might not be their guy, he might not be capable, he might not be that genuine, uh, if they had the ability to totally upturn the system and get him elected in the first place, what do you think their, the mass reaction is going to be if people become uh, disillusioned on a, on a really broad scale? Kind of like the, uh, the antithesis to uh, Obama's hope and change, uh, but only uh, for the conservative side. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, as a Christian, I, I, I believe that, uh, first of all, the biggest mistake we could make is to place our hope in one single man. Um, that that's just uh, asking for trouble and destructive. I, but you know, w one thing that he did do is he wrote, you know, he woke up a, a sleeping giant. I just saw, I just saw a poll. I wish I could find out where I saw it yesterday. It was like thirty six percent of the people in America consider themselves to be conservatives. Only twenty five percent liberal. Thirty six to twenty five percent. The rest are just kind of floating through life. They're so the unaffiliated, non-committal, uh, just whatever happens, happens. And <clears throat> so the, the conservatives vastly outnumber the liberals, but they're conservative. They don't speak up. They don't make waves. They don't shout. They don't get in fights. 
they're conserved, they're quiet. But this woke him up. Uh, the the threat of having really a, a communist uh, uh, influenced uh, future president possibility woke people up. And uh, of course, Obama helped a lot with that too. That that really roused people. Unfortunately, not four years ago, he got in twice, but uh, people were saying definitely not uh, not opposed to a woman president, just opposed to that woman as president. Yeah, and uh, they they rose up. But the danger is for people to check out again, thinking that we made it. They did their part. They went and voted for Trump. They got Hillary out, and uh, now everything's good. Now is the time that people need to be. In, you will not fix the problems in America in from Washington D.C. The only solutions are at the local level and at the state level, but you've got to start locally. You've, I mean, with your sheriff, with your county commissioners, even your city council, which always tend to seem seem to tend, if I'm saying that right, to lean to the left. Uh, that's got to change. In conservative strongholds, you'll see city councils leaning strongly to the left, uh, but the county commissioners, your state legislators, your state senators. Those are the fights that people need to get in, involved in, get behind, and uh, really rally behind the causes, you know, the civic groups and their local communities. Local is is the key, and at the state level, not Washington. That's not where we should be focused. Uh, it's interesting what's happening, and yes, it does impact us, but uh, anybody who's been in the fight for liberty, for our heritage and our values— understands that uh, fighting anything at wa the Washington, D.C. level, unless you have a billionaire in your pocket, is like taking uh, you know, one step forward and two steps back. So people, but, uh, yeah, people shouldn't delude themselves thinking they're going to change things on this, uh, this big national level. I mean, do what they can, but, you know, they got to keep their eye on the prize, right? You know, at well, the end absolutely. of the day, it's 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 local. It's your your friends, your family, your tribe, your people around you that you know and you can trust. And that's where the the, the money, the effort, the energy is best spent. And the government that you have the most impact in on is the one that's closest to you. And uh, the further the way they are, the the less impact that the citizens have on their on their government as far as accountability and oversight and uh, influence. So, and the other thing too, that people are slowly awaking to is the power that local governments have to push back against federal mandates. We've seen this with the Environmental Protection Agency or with uh, the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, many of these uh, agencies that have just grown to eat the substance out of you know the, the people that uh, those local county governments and even state level governments that push back, they win when they do that. But it's so hard to convince them that they have that power. It's like an elephant being tethered to a stake with a string. And uh, he doesn't realize he has the power to, to, you know, to break free from that. So uh, if we can do that, and really it comes down to education, we are just... Uh, uh, illiterate as a nation, as far as our heritage, our history, um, our constitution, our founding documents, and the intent that the founding fathers had for this country. Yeah, to that. you're absolutely right. I, that's, you know, certainly something uh, in ignorance and naivety that I've been guilty of myself. Uh, I live in an American readout state now, and, and we're blessed with a uh, state representative that that really helped me become aware of the power of you know local government local politics with the help of the people with the people behind the rights uh, you know like you say county commissioner or representative uh, there's enormous power that's where the power grows from from the the people and I never really realized that was uh, an option I mean we're kind of brainwashed as you mentioned you know the the public education system to think that well you know everything happens in uh, in DC they have the power it's uh, you can't fight. Uh, you know, the proverbial city hall, so why bother? But it's not the case, though, as you're alliterating. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> very true. And uh, once again, it goes back to education. You, the, the people have to be educated. They have to be 
You cannot be empowered if you're not educated. And you have to be educated in the right things as well because there's so much misinformation and disinformation out there. People are confused. We've got patriots that are arguing uh, on behalf of the founding fathers that are, are teaching the exact opposite of things that the founding fathers taught. They're just regurgitating one-liners from Pinterest memes that <laughs> look like they were written from the left. And uh, they're, they're, uh, they're just, their education is very shallow as far as, as far as that goes. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. We definitely have some challenges ahead of us, uh, even with Trump in place. Uh, now Obama, well, he's trying to make the last use of his, his last hours. It was glorious to see a moving van pull up in front of the White House today. Yeah. <laughs> Jump on a plane and go help him pack. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's funny. But, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we definitely, uh, we have some challenges. We can move all the troops. He can move all the, the next two weeks. He can move troops up on uh, the Lithuanian border. He can... Uh, rant and rave and uh, you know, try to sell out Israel and throw them under a bus and everything else. But he's going to be out of there. And uh, everybody's kind of holding their breath right now to make sure that he does get out of there. But, you know, there's some other challenges, too. And this, not, this is not about Obama and Trump and Hillary. We've got down at the social level, at the, gr at the ground level, we're a sick society. We're divided. We're um, hostile toward each other. There's so much division in this country. You've got probably one of the largest uh, orchestrated uh, protests against Trump that's being planned mostly by communist backed organizations uh, to try to disrupt and uh, subvert this next administration, starting from the inauguration. I mean, they want to start burning, burning stuff in the streets and tearing things down as soon as he's inaugurated. So now yeah, we've got some pretty deep seated issues in our culture that it really doesn't matter who's in the White House. Um, it, it's a it's a big problem. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we saw remember when uh, Bush was president, not that I'm a uh, was necessarily a fan of Bush, but Boy, the protesters were really out in force. I mean, can you imagine what it's going to be like under Trump? The uh, the Marxist protests are going to be like tenfold, I I would imagine. Um, well, look at how many simultaneous riots broke out just at the news that Trump won. Yeah, yeah. But that you took know, them by surprise. So they didn't have time to plan. They just everybody knew Hillary was going to win. So now they've had they're going to have they will have had three months to plan the anarchy, and they are. Uh, you know, you follow the Twitter feeds and uh, Black Lives Matter and 1% and, or 99% and uh, all these others, they're planning for mayhem. Who knows what it'll actually turn into, but... They've um, got a lot of money behind them. I mean, presumably Soros money and other, uh, you know, lots of uh, globalists and, uh, you know... Correct. Yeah. You, you know, you, you've, we keep using this word, uh, we, and, and we even, you mentioned this, you know, divided nation we live in. Uh, that's pretty significant. I mean, so, you know, let's take like a really broad look at the whole picture. Is there even an American nation left? I mean, to define a nation as a, a group of like-minded people, socially, economically, culturally, with a, a shared history that, you know, surround themselves with a, a border and, and that's a, a country, right? So so that nation, I mean, I remember looking at that uh, that map, that famous voting map, right, where it showed the all of the areas, all of the counties where people voted for Trump and then Hillary. And it's like, you know, Trump looked like the whole country. And then there was this, uh, what do they call it, the, the Clinton archipelago. I mean, these tiny little island bastions of liberal cities were huge numbers of people, but they comprise such a small geographic area. And it's such a, a split up country, but it's not in, you know, there's the American readout. That's a, a defined geographic area. Uh, there's other areas right now, ironically, the uh, liberals in California are trying to secede. But in a nation or in a country where where there's such a split, I mean, geographically, there's such a split, you know, how does that play out? I mean, could it end up in a India-Pakistan situation where one half runs to the other side and the other half runs to the other side and slaughters everybody on, along the way? I mean, that would be like a horrible outcome. Or can the nation, can can the country exist where people are so 
divided and, and yet they're, you know, living uh, mixed up uh, amongst each other throughout this huge landmass? Well, historically, no, they they can't continue that way. I mean, uh, a a confrontation uh, is, is, you know, inevitable. One of them has to give. You know, you basically have uh, with, uh, I guess, God-fearing patriots, you know, the Christian conservative base against a, a liberal base, very hostile toward any traditional uh, American heritage, uh, you have an unstoppable object getting ready to collide with an unmovable object. Something's going to break. And so historically speaking, I, I just read, and I talked about this a while back, I talk a lot about history and refer back to world history, history of nations and empires and uh, republics. But there's one in particular called The Fate of Empires and Search for Survival by John Glove. And uh, he just really nailed it in a, I don't know, it's like 20 or 30 pages, 25 pages, something like that, a uh, thesis that he did on the fate of empires. And he's describing the fall of America. You know, when he's, when he's describing the history of all these empires. Now, what you're talking about is two different sides running to, you know, geographical locations. That's historical, and we're actually seeing that happen in the United States. Uh, we are very balkanized, if you will, in the United States. But uh, you're seeing a, a demo, several demographic shifts that are taking place. And there are some conservative strongholds like the American Redoubt, uh, the Cumberland Plateau, the uh, Texas – uh, even the heartland, Oklahoma, there are people that are moving away from built up urbanized areas and liberal areas, and they are moving to where they feel like they can breathe free again. And they're demographically changing the, the air, not changing, strengthening what's already there. It's already conservative. Uh, and the liberal strongholds are becoming increasingly uh, strengthened as well. Uh, not a big demographic shift there, except for the uh, the Latino community, where you've had this demographic shift, which is historical. I mean, there's plenty of historical examples where you move so many people of the same same kind, mindset, language, uh, values, and ideals into an area, you're going to take that area over eventually. At some point, the Southwest United States will be a Latino nation. Uh, it might not be for 20 years or uh, 120 years, but that is that is coming. It's completely shifted demogra demographically. Uh, the American Redoubt is another one of those. In California, people don't want to necessarily move out of the state of California, but they'll move north to what is uh, referred to as the state of Jefferson uh, in the southern I don't know, like three or four counties of Oregon and the northern five or six counties of California is the state of Jefferson. And uh, conservative-minded Americans are moving into those, those enclaves where they have uh, more you know, conservative local governments, uh, county governments, and sheriffs that don't want to put up with a, a lot of the, the liberal, communist-influenced, politically correct type of uh, ideologies. So... Uh, you can't continue as a nation like the Oh, and then you've got now Eastern Washington uh, also vying to become the 51st state with the state of liberty uh, to break off from the liberal Western Washington. So you can see these divisions that are taking place all over and, and not just on with conservatives. We saw this in Northern Colorado, uh, the Northern, I think six counties, uh, one, they tried to break off. Uh, of course, that depends on the state legislature approving it, and they were not going to let those people go. So uh, that failed. But even on the left, you've got the new Black Panther Party now calling for all like-minded blacks to move to a, a, a common region so that they can form their own black nation. So we're deeply divided in this country. It seems like a natural outcome of of things i mean don't people want to be amongst uh people they like people they get along with people they speak a common language with uh 
I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, we all look back, of course, on the Civil War. I mean, what a what a you know horrible, brutal uh, event that had to take place. And here was uh, you know a group of states that had their own uh, you know cohesive sense of identity and culture, and and they wanted to kind of return to the Articles of Confederation and do their own thing. And it's been nice being part of the country. We're, we're going to be off on our own right now, right now. And the federal government, of course wouldn't let them do that and it resulted in a in a horrible war it was like a quarter of a million or, or a quarter of the population of uh you know fighting age young men were killed uh clearly the the united states federal government wanted to keep them in the fold no matter what uh but now you know as you just mentioned there's so many different uh elements out there i mean not just conservative but uh you know liberal elements and, and you know the the growing uh latino movement in the southwest i mean so many different people with so many completely different ideologies it, it really makes you wonder is it an american nation anymore or, or is it just natural outcome that eventually things uh you know balkanize to use a term yeah and the, it, it is it's it's historical it's it's like a uh, like a recipe that you know you put all the ingredients together you're going to have a predictable outcome of, you know the results and all the all the ingredients are there for uh, well, all the signs are there for a, a dying empire and a dying uh, culture, basically, from, you know, departing from, from what it was. And uh, the other interesting thing that, that Glub pointed out is that uh, when you introduce diversity for the sake of diversity, uh, that is one of the final uh I guess the final what would be the straw the camel back. Yeah, the yeah. final now. Death throes or of the empire or uh, yeah. Something. All through all through history, we've seen this. Now, you know, if you live in a um, uh, I don't know, all all white community, and you've got a, a black guy living in your town, and he works down at the the hardware store, everybody gets along. But when you say, you know what? there's just not enough black people here. Well, then we're going to start bringing them in. And then there's division and there's animosity. And we're going to give these guys more jobs because, well, we want, want them to prosper. And then they start pushing out, you know, people that uh, that were indigenous to that area. I'm just using that as just a, a case example. But when you, when you, when things naturally take their course, uh, there aren't any problems. But when you say, you know, we must have more diversity and you force diversity, that's always been the sign at the, the tail end of a, of a dying empire. And so uh, then you have this natural, then it goes the opposite way, like two magnets pushing away from each other. And that's where you have a liberal bastions, not even based on race, but it's ideal, ideological, uh, you know, around the San Francisco area and uh, Berkeley. And you're, if you're conservative, they're, they will, they will hurt you. I mean, they'll spray paint your car. They'll key your car. You'll you'll get beat up by a mob. Um, they'll paint swastikas on your door and everything else to run you out of there if you if your ideals are not in line with theirs. Uh, so, and then then you go you know for diversity for the sake of diversity back to a hardcore division and the balkanization and then there's conflict. And in every case, well, no, in almost every case, let me back up, in every case where a foreign entity didn't invade and, uh, you know, through conquest, left to itself, every empire that's fallen has fragmented and turned out to be several self-ruling nation states. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking that's of what it's very, very uh, likely to happen if we follow the same trajectory as every other empire, uh, notwithstanding outside influences from a from conquest, from an invading foreign government military, uh, then you will see the United States fragment, fracture, and you'll see several smaller self-ruling nation states rise out of that. And what determines what style and type of government and values that they have has everything to do with the majority of the demographics in that region. So seeing that we're at the uh, an empire in decline and seeing how historically nations have uh, followed a, a predictable path, 
uh, I I really resonated with the concept of the American Redoubt, and that's why I started Radio Free Redoubt to begin um, really encouraging like-minded uh, American citizens that hold those those values, those traditional American ideals, uh, primarily Christian ideals, to begin considering demographically relocating strategically to the American Redoubt, and basically the Pacific Inland Pacific Northwest. And there, it's not the only uh, safe haven for conservative-minded patriots. But it is definitely uh, on uh, out in front, uh, leading the way for uh, for others to follow. That whole you know? notion certainly took off, uh, you know, especially under Obama. I mean, that's you know, everybody's trying to think where can I flee, where can I move to, where can I save myself. Uh, whether that becomes lackadaisical for a little bit of time under Trump, and people think, well, maybe I'll wait it out in wherever they are, you know, some some city or some other part of the country that. That remains to be seen. I don't know. It seems like there's um, certainly that that movement is a pretty strong movement, and it seems like people will still keep moving to the readout or whatever you know readout or section of the country that they want to be in. Um, you, you know, a thought I've had is you're a communications expert, and you you know you understand and uh, preach the necessity of communication. Without that, there's there's really nothing. So I'm wondering, can a virtual nation can uh, a, a vast communications network uh, people communicating being in touch with one another can that enable a virtual nation to exist that transcends uh, you know geographic connections can somebody on one side of the country share something in common and live in this virtual nation via communications networks with somebody on the other side or can they do that at least for the time being until they're able to physically move to uh, the American readout or some such place. Uh, you know, we live in a very interconnected uh, electronic world. Can can such a an electronic nation exist, if, if you understand what I'm getting at? Well, yeah, a, a virtual nation, I guess, and we see that all the time. There's multiple virtual nations, <laughs> uh, self-ruling people that are congregating together uh, with common ideals and values uh, on the left and the right. And... Uh, as long as the internet's there, then that that's only going to you know continue to to grow, um, left to itself and without outside influence. But uh, you know there there are folks that are in the Appalachians uh, that are you know very conservative region up and down there and and uh, as far as staying in touch as far as communications, uh, you know somebody in the American Redoubt is on a internet blog or website sharing the same ideals and values and interests as the guy in in uh, the Appalachians. But if the internet's not there anymore, then our world's going to get really small again. So as far as placing emphasis on communications, that's critical. Like you mentioned, if you don't have communications, you don't have anything. You don't have news and information. You follow all of these examples of uh, just in the last uh, 30, 40 years, nations that have uh, gone down uh, in uh, South Africa, in uh, Venezuela, in Bosnia, these different places, they said whoever had communications ruled because there was no, there was, or they were a hero because people are hungry for news and information. People couldn't coordinate efforts. They had no idea what was going on. If it was safe to go from this town to that town, they had no idea what was in between if they didn't have communications. So, you know, you have no command and control. Your leadership can't coordinate. Uh, your, your citizens cannot be informed. So, yeah, communications is really big. And that's what we plan for with, with, with AMRON, the American Redoubt Radio Operators Network, is now a nationwide, it was beyond nationwide now, but uh, like-minded people that practice you know, all forms of communications, including ham radio, to stay connected, to share information, and to uh, to gather, you know, stay informed. Would it be safe so, to say that uh, people, can, you know, you say uh, communications to a lot of uh, people that really don't know a lot of technical stuff, and would it be safe to say that uh, they need to realize that the, the Internet is changing as we know it with the U.N.? 
taking over elements of it, uh, you know, the, the normal search engine functions that we've known that usually give us a fairly accurate, uh, you know, return on what we're looking for out there might not function that way anymore. People need to realize, like, if there's a, a site they want to, you know, be on, they got to get the IP address and keep that stashed away just in case the normal search functions don't work and people need to realize that, hey, cell phones might not work or the Voxer they use might not work. They have to get into what you're talking about, Amron and Ham Radio and uh, Channel 3 Project and all the other forms of communications out there. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. And we're always working on, uh, on projects. We've got some stuff going on behind the scenes to <clears throat> try to branch out from that, you know, just get away from from the, the Ham Radio, not get away from, but to augment you know, ham radio as well. Uh, we've got several uh, radio operators across the country that operate what are called Black Echo rebroadcasting stations. And uh, those are F- FM and AM transmitters that, you know, they can inform the local local communities just on the AM and FM dial, just a regular commercial broadcasting. But uh, they can broadcast to the local communities in an emergency to, to keep – you know, everybody informed, even if you're not real technically savvy, a lot of the black echo radio operators, you know, run their own, like it's a little, little miniature radio station. So, you know, they're gathering information from the Amron nets over shortwave and ham radio and, and the, the local nets and uh, satellite downlinks and things like that. And then they're rebroadcasting the information to the local community in an emergency. And uh, we've actually employed that. Uh, in uh, real emergencies before the uh, Washington wildfires is uh, very useful. So, yeah, there's there's all kinds of ways that we are always trying to work to kind of enhance that communications, that whole concept of keeping people informed. You know, uh, I, I'm aspiring uh, at comms and radio myself for a couple of years now, and it's a lot of information. I, I still find it kind of overwhelming. I really don't, uh, you know, I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg trying to learn this stuff. And uh, prior to our interview today, I went on the Amron site and your uh, Radio Free Readout site and, and checked everything out again. And it is a lot of information. I know that somebody that's just a total novice that might be hearing you know, this interview for the first time, this podcast for the first time, or they might be learning about you for the first time, and they're going to go to uh, the you know listeners out there. You definitely got to check out Amron, A-M-R-R-O-N, awesome site. I mean, they got to check that, and they're going to be hit with this, uh, you know, deluge of information. Can you give anybody some, uh, you know, inspiring uh, words or directions or where do they start first or what is it they're going to try to achieve? Because obviously communications can be taken to the the highest, most complex technical level of expertise, uh, you know, like yourself. I mean, you know all this stuff uh, so well, or it could be kept at a much more rudimentary level, somebody that just has their CB and knows that if something goes bad, they tune in channel three and listen to what's going on. Uh, yeah. Any pointers out there for the uh, the newbies, I guess? Yeah. First of all, remember, communications is like saying, uh, hey, I, w- I want to get into uh, transportation. Uh, you know, what do you think? I'm like, well, geez, uh, do you want to hike or do you want to fly a rocket ship? I mean, or anything in between. So just getting into, you know, transportation for the sake of transportation you need to know what your what your goals are uh, you're not going to get to the moon by hiking all right so um when it comes to communications you can figure out you know what are your goals and really you've got to want it uh if if you really want to be a communicator uh, not just a, a guy with a radio in your hand you, you know uh geez let me back up. There are some, for people that are new on Amron.com, there's, we've got tabs, we've got information there of, you know, just getting started, click here. And, uh, and it really walks them through the very basics of, you know, communications, lots of videos and resources, but it's a journey. Uh, if you want to go deep into it, it, you know, if you want to fly a rocket ship, you're going to have to start out with some basics and it's going to be a long process, a learning process any skilled communicator, uh, radio operator, uh, didn't get that way in a week. It's they're dedicated to it. It's something that they've been involved in for years, and so it's it's a compilation of all these little bits and pieces of information and knowledge that have accumulated over over years. So 
I, you know, I, I get people sometimes they'll, they'll say, uh, uh, you know, Hey, uh, I, I want to be able to talk to my, uh, my, my brother-in-law in, uh, Wisconsin, you know, I live in central Washington, you know, uh, what do I need to get? And I usually tell them a radio operator because, uh, they say, well, just give me a list. Just tell me you know, what's my list. That's, that's your, that's at the, that's your list right there. You need a radio operator because, uh, usually they don't want to hear all the technical stuff. They, they want to say, well, what antenna should I get? Well, it depends because different antennas behave differently. They will treat your signal differently. Uh, uh, whether, you know, you want to talk to somebody just a, a mile away or a thousand miles away, there's different bands that behave differently. Um, there's different radios with different capabilities. So that's, I mean, there's more than we can obviously get into in a, in just a podcast, but, uh, I always start, start off with, look, if you have nothing and you realize communications are important, then get yourself two things. First of all, a scanner. So you can listen to local traffic. Uh, you can listen to the local towing truck company, the police department, the, you can listen to the local ham operators in any emergency, the ham radio operators have a corner on the information market. They're spread out. They're connected together, but they're spread out all over the place. There are a lot of eyes and ears that are saying, hey, this bridge is out here. Uh, don't come this way, right? So a scanner is going to give you that local intelligence, that information that's happening. And uh, and then for long-range stuff, for throughout your region, your state, and even in different parts of the country, a shortwave radio with single sideband capabilities. That's going to give you the ability to at least receive information. You can learn a lot about that by going to Amron.com. You can watch the series of videos that we have. We've got a comms up series of kind of like docudramas, like mockumentaries. And uh, there's a lot of information there about uh, communications. And it's not for everyone. It's like not everybody in your house should go get their paramedics license so you'll know what to do in a, in a medical emergency. You know, most groups or families will designate the person who has the interest and the desire, the will, the something that, the, man, I love this stuff. I, I want to be the, the the group paramedic. Okay, fine. You're the guy. And then uh, if you want to be the radio operator, not not everybody needs to be a licensed ham radio operator with HF capabilities and running digital modes and all this stuff. You pick the guy that has a just an inherent interest in that and uh, you foster that. So you've got a communications specialist in your group. You've got a medical specialist in your group, you know, and uh, so that, that makes, that makes great sense. Uh, yeah. I'm, you know, bottom line, it's, there's no easy way. You got to, got to learn this stuff. I like what you say though, about uh, they can get a scanner, they can get a, a shortwave radio and they can listen. That's uh, that's awesome because at least that's something people can do right now and get the instant gratification and have fun and be informed, see what's going on. They can't talk, but maybe that will inspire that, that person out there, that maybe child out there like, Hey, this radio stuff is awesome. I really want to get into it. And then, then you'll have yeah. your radio guy that emerges from that. Uh, that's, that's great. So everybody out there, get yourself a scanner, get yourself a short wave and, and just listen. It's uh, it's pretty easy. Absolutely. And we've got nets, regularly scheduled nets all across the country. And we've got national nets. You can listen on shortwave if you have single sideband capabilities on your radio and, uh, and tune in and start practicing that stuff and watch the videos. We have a major training exercise every summer called T-Rex. So T-Rex 2017, we're already beginning the planning on that. Uh, major nationwide grid down scenario based exercise with a uh, heavy emphasis on the communications. So, uh, and just the regular nets that happen every other week, the national nets happen on the first and third week of the month, gives uh, people an opportunity to tune in, check their gear, test their gear. And then there's always that one person in every group or family that gets the bug and they want to go out and actually get their first little transceiver so they can transmit and receive and uh, maybe go get their ham license. And then they want to upgrade to general class and so they can operate on the HF bands. And uh, it just grows from there into the digital modes. And, you know, we send email over the radio, uh, independent of any infrastructure, no power, no Internet. And we're sending emails back and forth to each other. Yeah, that's so cool. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very cool thing, but it is an investment in time, um, energy, money. It's not cheap. Uh, just like your, 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 the medic in your group is going to be investing hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in their, their specialty. It's no different when it comes to uh, communications. So, uh, yeah, you can go as, as deep into it as you want. Wow, this is, uh, this is really awesome stuff. I'd love to speak with you about this all day. I definitely want to speak with you again about this. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time here, and we're going to have to end this, uh, this podcast. But I really appreciate having you here today, John. If there's any uh, you know, uh, blogs or sites or anything you want to quickly uh, promote or, or mention, that would be, uh, that would be great. Uh, and then I think we'll wrap things up. Absolutely. Well, we've got uh, two websites that, that we run. Uh, RadioFreeRedoubt.com is a, uh, it's a weekly podcast every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. We also do a radio show on uh, the Liberty Broadcasting Service out of Spokane on the AM dial and the FM dial. And uh, that's really more uh, politically oriented, a very overtly Christian patriot oriented. We talk about the issues. We talk about uh, well, just a lot of stuff. And then Amron is the uh, website for the American Redoubt Radio Operators Network, really oriented toward disaster, grid down communications. We have uh, a podcast that um, we're reviving after a six-month hiatus called Partisan Radio. Get into all kinds of radio uh, techniques and um, that we do a lot of uh, covert type of communications, one-time pads, not on ham radio, but we practice with, uh, it's kind of the old, old time partisan resistance type of, uh, covert communications as well as the, uh, ham radio and disaster communications. So it's a lot of fun. It's really diverse and, um, there's just a lot of information there and lots of help too with the, with the network. That sounds great. Uh, you know, keep up the good work. You're definitely doing a lot of uh, work out there. Couldn't be done without you. And we really appreciate having you today, John. And we look forward to talking to you soon. All right. Thank you, Lance, for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, just God bless you guys with what you're doing and, and your podcast. And just keep up the great work. Hey, definitely. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.